Okay. Well, uh, also thank you for the technical support. Um, and yeah, so I'm uh, I'm going to talk about um, an area that I've been uh, motivated to pursue for uh, a few years now, uh, and really inspired actually uh, by specifically by the, the Cold Adam community, and um, try to give uh, some context to what it is that we're really, in some sense, only beginning to undertake at the moment. And um, so actually, I'm, I'm, at the moment, I'm working in a field that does not exist. And uh, so we, but we still can give it a name, uh, correlated nanoelectronics. And really, uh, it's at the intersection of two fairly well-established fields. Uh, one uh, the field of, sort of correlated, strongly correlated materials uh, that have interesting properties, but generally are three-dimensional bulk systems. Um, and then uh, on the other side is the field of semiconductor uh, heterostructures and nanostructures where uh, the degree of control and dimensional reduction has taken us to the single um, spin or, or charge uh, limit uh, where there's enormous uh, sensitivity and um, the, the prospect of doing, for example, quantum information processing. Uh, so we're interested in actually combining uh, these two paradigms and uh, there are two things that you could imagine happening, well, maybe three. Uh, so one is that, uh, in, in, let's say we decide to make a device, uh, um, like uh, you know, some transport device, uh, but using a different material. So the idea is that that material may uh, you know, be like, a super, may supercharge the device, or give it new properties that were, were not uh, uh, existing, or beyond the limits of uh, the material on which uh, we traditionally work. Um, another uh, way of thinking about this is from the perspective of uh, the other side, where uh, we use the uh, amazing sensitivity of these devices, which can send single electrons and spins, uh, and apply them to these materials to, to derive new insight into those materials, which uh, uh, might be difficult otherwise. Uh, so then you might also think that you can actually do something completely new. Uh, that really is uh, uh, quite distinct from uh, either of these. Uh, and really, I think that's, again, why I'm, I'm so glad to, to be here at, at this conference. So this is sort of more of the outlook, uh, which I'll get to toward the end of the talk. So the star uh, of the, my talk is going to be strontium titanated. We, we heard uh, something uh, about strontium titanated on, on Wednesday. Emilio uh, actually even talked about heterostructures. Uh, so these are materials, really, that have um, uh, such a wide variety of properties, uh, and they're all represented here in the faces of, uh, of a die, and, and you can roll the dice and, and get all these different properties actually from a single mat material. So you could think of it as a fruit fly, or maybe a stem cell, I don't know, I'm, I'm not, uh, the biology is not my strong point, but uh, uh, this is an interesting quote from Marvin Cohen, who is um, uh, involved in the first discovery of superconductivity. And he wrote that the complexities of the crystal structure, lattice wave, band structure, transport properties, impurity electrons, and superconductivity have inspired the comment, which I think was maybe his comment. If strontium titanate had magnetic properties, a complete study of this material would require a thorough knowledge of all solid state physics. So we like to think of it as a hydrogen atom of solid state. Uh, in fact, there are <coughs> magnetic properties of strontium titanate, but I won't talk about them today. So uh, I, my interest is going to center around um, what happens when you put the strontium titanate in proximity with a thin layer of another perovskite material, lanthanum aluminate. And really, again, all the, the, the physics is really uh, going to be dominated by the strontium titanate, but uh, um, uh, slightly influenced by the boundary condition of the lanthanum aluminate. Uh, and so it was discovered uh, uh, by Harold Huang, who was the Bell Laboratories at the time. Uh, that when you take these two insulators and you put them together, you can get a high mobility conductor at low temperatures. Uh, there's a very important result which inspired my work um, a couple of years later, which investigated the role of the, how many layers of this material, which can control, in fact, whether you become an insulator or a conductor. Um, and then uh, all the inherited properties of uh, strontium titanate that now can be revealed within the two-dimensional form, superconductivity, and the uh, electronic control that you have over this is really interesting, and the emergence of magnetism, uh, tunable spin-orbit interactions, uh, and so forth. So what we were interested in is really um, taking all of this to the nanoscale, controlling the metal insulator transition at extreme nanoscale dimensions, and making devices, and, and so forth. 
Uh, and so we were, again, inspired by uh, Joachim Manhart's work in 2006, where they began to look at the conductivity of the, uh, the stones as a function of how many unit cells would lamp them illuminate, and they found that uh, when you have fewer than four unit cells, the interface was always insulating, and when you have four or, or more, it was always conducting. Uh, but actually, what they found uh, even more interesting than that was that uh, at the critical thickness, uh, they could switch it back and forth metastably between the insulating and conductive state simply by applying plus or minus, minus 100 volts uh, to the back of the strontium titanate substrate. And so uh, uh, plus 100 volts would, would bring it to the conducting state, and it would remain in the conducting state even when you turn off the voltage. So uh, in some sense, it's like a bit, uh, but, a, but it's a big bit because the distance here is rather large. So uh, we began to collaborate and, uh, and realize that the other surface is only uh, less than two nanometers from this interface. And we decided to apply voltages on the top surface instead of the bottom surface. Uh, the idea is very inspired, um, really was inspired by a toy that I used to play with as a child, the Etch-a-Sketch. Uh, and so the way the Etch-a-Sketch works is you have aluminum powder on the inside of this uh, uh, enclosure. And uh, this is transparent but uh, it becomes reflecting when the aluminum sticks to the inside, and then you can scrape it off with a, uh, a probe. Uh, and you can move the probe with these uh, knobs here and create uh, wonderful drawings if you have the talent. Um, so of course, we, we, we grow up, uh, we put away our toys, um, but they remain in our mind, and we, we, we call them tools instead. This is an atomic force microscope, and uh, instead of having this blunt tip, which is maybe a, a a uh, few millimeters uh, radius of curvature. We take uh, a, a conductive AFM tip, which has a radius of curvature of a few nanometers. Uh, and we are going to use this to apply voltages to the top surface of this lens and illuminate. And the uh, positive voltages are going to locally switch to the conductive state, and the negative voltages are going to restore the insulating state. So here is a, a sort of an anatomical diagram of uh, the structure. Again, this is the thin layer of lens and illuminate. And first thing we're going to do is to make electrical contact to the interface. So we're going to mill away uh, and then put gold uh, or uh, titanium. And then this is going to be our canvas, basically, in this area. And so what we do is we take this conductive AFM tip and we apply either positive voltages or negative voltages. The positive voltages are locally going to charge the top surface. So I'm not going to talk too much unless somebody's interested at the end uh, about what's happening here. But we believe we're, we're protonating the surface. We're putting these plus charges here, which are attracting electrons to the interface. And uh, if you apply a negative voltage, then you can locally restore that insulating <coughs> phase. And you can do this on a really uh, small uh, uh, scale. So this is kind of a typical uh, structure that we might create. And we can make many of these electrodes. And we can uh, the green regions, again, represent the conductive areas. Uh, and then uh, we can also cut uh, wires by applying negative voltages, and those will create tunnel barriers or insulating regions. And in fact, we use this process of erasing to determine the width of these structures, which can be as small as 2 nanometers. So that's less than the average spacing between electrons at, the, at this interface, which is on the order of 10 to the 13 per square centimeter. Okay, so uh, I, these are sort of just a sort of a quick overview of the kinds of directions in which we've moved since we began to, since we discovered this, we, we can make uh, transistors, uh, we can make uh, rectifying junctions that uh, conduct only in one direction, uh, we can make photoconductors, we can um, try to scale them up if you're interested, you know. Actually, we haven't had too much luck uh, with uh, applied uh, directions of uh, funding, but um, uh, basically, uh, in terms of uh, uh, interesting transport properties, this has been very uh, fruitful. So for example, we found that we could increase the mobility just by uh, reducing the dimensionality uh, to the, the quasi-1D regime. Uh, we can also use these optical detectors to do broadband terahertz spectroscopy at molecular scale. Um, and then we've also began to more recently look at what happens at low temperatures, making single electron transistors. Uh, looking at the superconducting state of nanostructures, and I'll spend some more time talking about that, uh, where we see a lot of interesting sort of non-local transport and so forth. Um, in fact, uh, we've also done some experiments at room temperature. We, we can explore the magnetic properties, uh, which are electronically tunable. We can um, interface them with other systems like graphene and so forth. 
Uh, this is actually one of the things I'm going to be talking about right now, uh, which is uh, basically an example of how uh, the mesoscopic devices, so from one side, the right side of that picture, uh, can basically reveal new properties of the underlying material, in this case, the strontium titanate. And, uh, one way of thinking about this is that uh, we actually can observe um, and even tune uh, the type of uh, uh, interaction between electrons, making uh, pairs of electrons be, be either more or less favorable than the single particles. So uh, this is basically uh, the story of superconductivity in strontium titanate, which was discovered uh, and uh, reported first in 1964 as the first superconducting semiconductor, uh, really remarkable that with so few carriers you could actually reach a, a superconducting state. Uh, and then later on, uh, there was a, 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 a follow-up work where they basically changed the doping concentration on the horizontal axis and found uh, this uh, dome-like feature here. Now, it's really interesting because this is for the young people in the audience, right? You know, we often read papers, and we cite, we, we, so we cite a lot of papers without reading them. Very interesting quote here. The non-monotonic temperature dependence bears a striking resemblance to high temperature superconductors, which will be discovered 20 years from now. <laughs> so, okay, I, I don't think that quote was actually in the paper, but uh, I'm not sure, I never, I, I never read the paper. But, uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, so, but anyway, this is actually was, uh, strontium titanate actually was uh, material that was uh, one of the uh, inspirations for high temperature superconductors. Uh, and in fact, uh, the first theory of, uh, to, to really understand how it is that you can have a, a superconductivity at low temperatures really made a very fascinating prediction that, it was, uh, that you could, in fact, uh, have pairing that was so strong that it, re it was retained even outside of the superconducting state. And this is, of course, in more modern parlance, has been uh, known as the BEC-BCS crossover, which, of course, uh, had um, uh, been uh, explored so uh, successfully in, in ultra-cold atoms. Uh, and so basically, uh, there hasn't been too much progress since, the, since this theory uh, in the 60s, but um, what we've been able to do is, uh, in fact, try to uh, uh, ask the question, you know, do, is it really possible for electrons to pair outside of the superconducting state? And the way that we can do this is by using a single electron transistor. So the way an, an SET works is it, it looks like a transistor. It has a source and a drain, uh, and there's an island in between here, a quantum dot, uh, where the chemical potential is, or the number of electrons inside of this quantum dot is tuned by the gate. So you can increase the voltage and put more and more electrons into the quantum dot. And as you transition from n minus 1 to n to n plus 1, what happens is those two states actually become resonant. So they have the same energy. n minus 1 has the same energy as n. And at that point, you can resonantly tunnel uh, from source to the quantum dot to the drain. You can get sequential tunneling. Uh, and that gives you a conductance peak. And that really tells you a lot about the structure within the quantum dot. Uh, and these uh, states uh, have spin and so forth. And what you can see is that uh, there's a stability diagram that uh, when you're off resonance, for example, you can get sequential tunneling, but if you are um, not, uh, if you're in between levels, then in fact you have a blockade effect. And so the general structure uh, stability diagram is a function of the gate voltage, which tunes how many electrons there are, and the source drain voltage looks like these diamonds. And basically, this is a stable state of n minus one, n, n plus one, and so forth. Uh, and the latter here really comes from the charging effects uh, on the quantum dot as well as the uh, uh, interactions so uh, the ortho uh, orthogonality uh, requirements for the fermions. So basically, these peaks then uh, can shift in a magnetic field if you apply a magnetic field. And that, what that will do is basically take a diagram that looks like this uh, and change the size of these diamonds. So this one might get smaller, this one gets larger. And really, what that corresponds is, uh, to is these uh, energy levels moving up and down in the same shift in a magnetic field. So you can look at the zero bias conductance, and you see peaks that basically will uh, split in a magnetic field. One thing you will not see is uh, basically a doubling, for example, just as a random example, of the number of diamonds that you uh, see here. Really, this is counting the stable states of having a fixed number of electrons. 
So we can make these kinds of structures, and here you see a quantum dot is actually a line segment here uh, surrounded by two tunnel barriers, and then we have a gate here. There's actually a control structure, which I won't talk about, uh, but you can see, in fact, the same diamond patterns that I was showing you uh, schematically only a few minutes ago. And so again, this is the horizontal axis, which is making, uh, putting more and more electrons into this line segment, this dash-shaped quantum knot. Um, and then there's, a, there's some other effects because we're actually uh, at 50 millikelvin. I'll get to this in a second. But what I want to do right now is focus on one of these diamonds. Uh, and I'm going to now apply a magnetic field. And so in the absence of magnetic field, we have this diamond shape. And if I go now to a one Tesla field, actually one Tesla, there's no uh, superconductivity. Uh, superconductivity dies uh, above 0.2 Tesla. Uh, but basically, there wasn't much of a change. And uh, at even at 2 Tesla, you don't see much going on. But now, when we go to 3 Tesla, you start to see this has gotten really blurry. Uh, but in fact, that's an uh, emergence of a second diamond. And you can see that the, now the diamonds are actually uh, e uh, equal pretty much in size at a magnetic field of 4 Tesla. So let me now just show you all of that. Those, uh, those per, uh, images at the same time. And if you look at the zero bias conductance, you see that there's a peak here, again, that goes basically with changing the number of electrons in this island. And uh, that peak now begins to bifurcate above a magnetic field of two Tesla. So this bifurcation really uh, is telling us that these are not stable states of n minus one, n, n plus one, but rather n minus two, n, and n plus two. So really, the stable ground state of the system is a, a state where you have pairs of electrons. Uh, and so this is quite unusual. You would not see this in ordinary uh, semiconductors. Uh, in fact, you would not see this even in an ordinary superconducting uh, single electron transistor because we're way above the upper critical field for superconductivity. Uh, in fact, we can also go above, way above the upper critical temperature. We can go, you know, it, it sort of, uh, well, experimentally, we've gone up to 900 millikelvin. TC is about 300. Uh, but we believe that the pairing temperatures can be as large as uh, several kelvin. Uh, so here is actually another uh, plot where I'm just showing the conductance uh, now at zero bias as a function of the gate voltage and magnetic field. And so what you see here is that um, well, there is a very a small region here which is associated with, with the superconducting state, but it, uh, it, if you remove that, uh, you see that there's a long straight region here where the energy of that state is basically not shifting with magnetic field. That's telling us that these pairs of electrons, in fact, are in a spin singlet state. Uh, and then above a field of two Tesla, they now break up. It's more energetically favorable to, for them to separate. Uh, and they're, in fact, they might, in fact, be joining together up here. So uh, the phase space for this electron pairing in the absence of superconductivity is really large. So we believe that the, basically that the pairing temperature is in the range of 1 to 10 Kelvin, which we can uh, extract from uh, the pairing field and the g-factor. And then um, the, 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 the actual pairing field is an order of magnitude larger than the upper critical field. So more than 99% of the phase space is one in which there's no superconductivity, but the electrons are still in, a, uh, in pairs. OK, so, uh, so uh, uh, I guess uh, um, following uh, uh, Andy Millis's uh, uh, talk, uh, you know, the, the most straightforward brute force thing you can do is to uh, to solve uh, exactly uh, the system for a very small case. And uh, so this is basically an attractive Harvard model where you have a uh, negative U here uh, term, and, uh, but uh, very few electrons. You know, just, you know, uh, th in fact, the number of electrons can be tuned by this parameter here. And what we're looking for is the stability of the system, how many electrons are going to be uh, in the lowest energy state as a function of magnetic field and, uh, and this chemical potential. And basically, uh, what you find, uh, maybe not surprisingly, is that uh, when you do have a strong attractive interaction, that you get a, a state where the pairs are, are favored. Um, and so uh, this is very similar to what we uh, observed experimentally. Um, there's also the, a reemergent pairing that's been predicted as well. OK, so uh, now taking a step forward, we can ask, uh, so I was, I was showing you this regime here, which is actually now the um, non-equilibrium case where we're taking a source strain bias and we can do spectroscopy. Uh, so here again is where we see this, uh, these peaks forming and then splitting above a pairing field. 
Uh, this is the, the region where we have electron pairing without superconductivity, but we can now uh, look at the higher uh, density state. In fact, what we see, um, and this is work done uh, in collaboration with Andrew Daly, um, but I'm only going to refer to it very fleetingly, is that uh, in this regime, we believe that in fact, uh, the interactions which were once attractive at low density uh, suddenly uh, uh, rather abruptly change sign. And so uh, here we can enter the repulsive regime, uh, which is characterized by the emergence of uh, Andrea bound states, uh, as well as the lack of uh, splitting of these states in a magnetic field. So there are several sig signatures, and uh, there's been some analysis done that's uh, consistent with this picture. Um, and uh, we believe that this uh, sign change is that in fact uh, uh, so, uh, is linked to the, uh, the onset of new bands of the shift transition that takes place. Okay, so now I'm going to move on to uh, another topic where, um, again, this is sort of the, the supercharging the existing type of structure by using a different material. Uh, and so uh, here we're creating correlated electron wave guides. And so uh, to give some context, basically, uh, of course, we're uh, maybe more familiar with optical waveguides, so optical fibers, usually single mode, but uh, we can, of course, think about different transverse modes of the uh, uh, wavefronts. Uh, and, but these are bosons, right? So here, we're interested in fermions, and fermions, we have uh, uh, the Pauli exclusion principle tells us that now the, the connectivity uh, through, a, uh, uh, through a constriction, for example, in two dimensions, is going to be governed by the number of quantum channels that are allowed to, to propagate. And so you get a connectivity that is quantized uh, by an integer n uh, times e squared over h. And so this was seen, in fact, uh, uh, back in the 80s. And the steps that you see here in the conductance, again, are in units of uh, 2 e squared over h because of the spin up and the spin down. Uh, so uh, these discrete electronic modes are very interesting because, uh, in fact, if you have a scanning probe microscope, and this is uh, work done uh, at Bob Westerville's group um, uh, back in 2000, where they uh, were able to actually image the transverse mode structure as you go through a quantum point contact. In fact, you can see these lobes, the transverse degrees of freedom, as you go from 1 to 2 to 3, you can, you can actually observe uh, the mode structure of the electrons as you uh, as they propagate <coughs> through these uh, structures. Um, so we're interested, in fact, uh, in making electron waveguides, which really means that you uh, need to have some constriction. Uh, and in fact, we're more interested in waveguides in which you can propagate over long distances, not over a point, but uh, over a line. And so we really refer to these as waveguides. Uh, these are structures which look similar to what I had shown you before, but now the tunnel barriers are much weaker. Uh, and we're going to get ballistic transport through these structures, and we can tune the, uh, 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 the orbital transverse uh, orbital structure with the gate. And so uh, one way of thinking about this naively is to say that, okay, this is my line of surface charges, which defines a potential, and the potential um, will be constant along the direction of the wire, uh, but then you will have a parabolic confinement, for example, maybe in the lateral direction, uh, and maybe some other, maybe linear uh, potential, a wedge-shaped potential along the z-direction. Those transverse degrees of freedom, in addition to the magnetic field, uh, is a single particle problem that you can solve this and basically uh, find out where the allowed state uh, states as a function of energy and magnetic field. So this is, of course, just the, the result of that calculation. Uh, and uh, once you have those eigenenergies as a function of magnetic field, uh, uh, then you can, in fact, plot the wave functions and um, you actually see the, the lobes, these are the tr all the transverse uh, modes that you would see in a two-dimensional electron system. Uh, but then you can also have vertical modes as well that show up at uh, different magnetic fields. So this is what uh, would be predicted by a naive model. Uh, and so uh, we can do these experiments. The way we do them is we apply um, a gate voltage and we tune these structures by um, uh, changing the chemical potential in these waveguides. And we can do this at different magnetic fields. Uh, and uh, then once you have the structure, then you can uh, differentiate it to figure out when you transition between uh, one integer of conduct quantum conductance to another. Uh, and that derivative is called the transconductance, and it looks like this. So, um, so this is uh, uh, basically a, the, an experimental result, and uh, one in which we have a, a, a 50 nanometer long quantum channel. 
Uh, but in fact, we can write a 50 nanometer quantum channel, uh, warm it up to room temperature, and rewrite a, another one that's one micron long, and get essentially the same result. <coughs> uh, and so uh, we believe that we really now have a, a, a really unprecedented c control over the transverse mode structure of these electron waveguides. They are ballistic over micron scales, um, and they are correlated. So they have very interesting properties. So for example, you can see level crossings here. This is a re-emergent pairing, we believe, uh, that occurs when these levels have opposite spin and they recombine. When they have the same spin, then you get avoided crossings. OK, so now the last part of my talk, uh, I'm, I'm hoping that the first parts have helped to motivate what we're really, uh, one of the main things that we're interested in is really going from these materials, uh, which of course are structured at the atomic scale, uh, and being able to coarse grain slightly to be able to control interactions uh, and to control the placement of artificial atoms and to create new types of quantum matter. So, Basically, uh, what we're trying to do is solid state quantum simulation, uh, again, using this platform that we've been working on for a number of years now, uh, where we do have this uh, 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 con configurability that's really uh, comparable to or slightly smaller than the mean spacing between electrons. Uh, we also, as I, I've shown you, have the ability to, uh, that, that these electrons have strong in interactions. Uh, they're uh, low densities, they're very strong and attractive higher densities, they are repulsive, so we can tune the interactions. Um, and then uh, this really sets up a number of challenges, right? So how can we create new forms of quantum matter? Uh, really, again, this is where our, our, we take our inspiration from uh, our <coughs> ultra-cold atoms and uh, optical lattices. Uh, we would like to make lattices of uh, electrons uh, and to, for example, uh, solve or, or, or simulate the uh, Fermi-Hubbard model. Um, and uh, of course, we really share uh, some of the uh, ambitions uh, of this community where we really want to gain insight into how you create superconductivity, what is the mechanism and so forth, um, and uh, maybe ultimately develop some novel quantum technologies or quantum materials that could be useful. So I'm not going to make too much of a comparison with ultra-cold atoms except along two uh, axes. Uh, so one of them is the effective temperature, uh, which of course I think we all understand. And I think we also in some sense understand what this means as well, is how well we understand the system. So uh, with ultra-cold atoms, um, one of the great things is that uh, the, the underlying Hamiltonian is extremely well understood. Many decades of research leading up to that understanding, uh, going back to the beginnings of, of, of quantum mechanics. And so, uh, but uh, 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 again, as uh, uh, Andrew also highlighted, you know, there are many challenges in being able to cool these temperatures down to a regime where you can see, uh, for example, antithermagnetic correlations or even other types of emergent long range order, especially uh, in the, the, the fermionic sector. So uh, solid state, I would say we're over here, right? We had no trouble getting to these strongly correlated ground states. We can see the superconducting state. Uh, the problem is that the physics really is not well understood. We don't understand the mechanism of this attraction. And uh, so that's something that we are uh, really very interested in doing this. And of course, in any type of state diagram, there are, there are ways to, to move around. And of course, uh, funding helps uh, to, to reach that goal. So um, I'm just uh, nearly done. And uh, I want to just say that um, uh, We've begun to, to do some work, uh, uh, but we took a bit of a sabbatical uh, because even the electron waveguides themselves without a super lattice uh, have a lot of uh, interesting uh, and not well understood properties. But we began to look at what happens if you uh, work in one dimension. So uh, presumably that's also easier theoretically. So the idea is again uh, the same technique, but what we're doing now is uh, creating an artificial super lattice with a period of five nanometers, which is close to the uh, uh, inter-electron separation. Uh, we also have a quantum point contact, and this is the kind of device that is fairly routine for us to make. And so then we can cool this down to low temperatures and, um, and high magnetic fields, 
And so basically, um, well, first the control structure. Again, these are the electron waveguides. And uh, here I'll just point out that the, a pairing is uh, very strong in this particular device. And you can see that because the, uh, even at very high magnetic fields, uh, up to a 15, 16 Tesla, you see that the conductance is 2e squared over h. Uh, and they just begin to uh, split at about 11 Tesla. So here is the device with the super lattice. And uh, so there's a lot of structure here, a lot of structure that we don't understand very well. But certainly, uh, you can see the differences between uh, the control structure and the super lattice. And I will point out that, that this is a reproducible structure. So we can, again, erase this and make another one. And, and basically, it looks almost identical. All of the features that you see here, uh, again, tying it down, down to a theory and a model um, is a challenge. OK, so let me summarize. Uh, we have this nanoscale control, extreme nano, nanoscale control of an interesting material system that has a lot of intrinsic properties. Uh, for, and uh, one of the things I, I showed you is that uh, these, uh, this is a system that has strong uh, affinity for pairing, uh, so strong that it exists outside of the superconducting state. Uh, and uh, also, uh, the ability that we have here to control this, uh, these structures lead to extremely clean electronic systems where you can have ballistic propagation on micron scales, but not just electrons. In fact, these are uh, electron pairs, in fact, can also exist as waveguides. Uh, and then we're very interested in moving in the direction of quantum simulation. Uh, and the example I gave you was the 1D super lattice. Okay, so uh, I just want to acknowledge now um, uh, my group uh, and my collaborators. So uh, these are our group, me group members and uh, uh, here as well. Um, and uh, uh, David Pecker is a colleague of mine who's also been working with Andrew Daly. Uh, Steve Helberg is a, is a theorist who did this uh, uh, brute force exact diagonalization uh, methods. Uh, and then all the materials that we get are from the group of Chen Long Ong at the University of Wisconsin, Madison, and uh, these are all the funding agencies. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. So it's very impressive the uh, ballistic transport you were telling us about. But what's the what's the mean free path of the tree pattern to the Yeah. So the, good question. So the the. Uh, the, the ballistic transport that we observe is in the, the quasi-one-dimensional quasi -one dimensional regime. Uh, the, the mean free path uh, is on the order of uh, maybe a few uh, tens of nanometers, or 100 nanometers or so. So uh, that's right. So it's uh, very different from the, so the, the effective dimensionality is really in, plays a very important role in uh, determining these uh, long ballistic lifetimes. So basically, we also see these effects all the way up to room temperature. So when we, uh, if we make a nanowire device, the mobility of strontium titanate at room temperature, dope strontium titanate, is about six centimeters squared per volt second. Uh, nothing to write home about. But uh, when you, uh, so we've done the uh, hall mobility measurements at room temperature of nanowires, and the mobility actually can go up to you know, three, 400 centimeters squared per volt, per volt second, and we do a hall measurement. Uh, and uh, so we believe that, that basically uh, the, the explanation is rather simple, that uh, you have uh, large and low angle scattering, and they all contribute. Uh, but the, in low angle scattering is essentially um, suppressed in the, in the quasi-1D environment because of a small angle, you'll just basically bounce off the sidewall and uh, maybe scatter into another mode but you're still moving forward, so you need a very strong impurity to, uh, to reverse the direction of the current. Of the current. Any further questions? Can you back up two slides? Not this one. Okay, okay, okay. Get it. Is the geometry of the quantum, uh, the quantum dot, it, it, like, like it's drawn there, that the, that the gate is fairly far away compared to the size? Uh, yes, so the gate is actually uh, maybe 500 nanometers away. Yeah. yeah. What is the stability of these structures? Stability, yeah. I didn't talk very much about the process uh, that, that, uh, that creates these structures. So basically, um, so we. Uh, when we write these structures, they last 
in, so we actually write them in ambient conditions, although we control the humidity. Humidity plays an important role in uh, uh, placing uh, these uh, positive charges here. But uh, if we don't do anything to the sample, just leave it in air, it will decay. So the natural state is the insulating state, but it will decay on the scale of uh, in a few hours. Uh, but if you put the sample in vacuum, then it, it persists indefinitely. And so you can, so actually most of the experiments that we do involve writing structure and then uh, walking, not running, running is dangerous, but we walk to the apparatus if it's a vacuum system or cryostat, and then uh, we have to worry about light and there are other things that we have to be careful of, so we use red light. But yeah, it's not, uh, it's, yeah, it's not something where it's going to persist, uh, at least at the moment, for, uh, for an indefinite amount of time under all environmental conditions. Yeah, actually, um, perhaps in, in comparison to something that Andy said, is not, you know, he's talked about having superconductors which are discovered for the wrong reason. One of the very first slides you showed was the old data plotting TC versus carrier concentration with a, with a dotted theory line which runs perfectly through the experiment. <laughs> um, uh, suggestions about some of the things you've just discovered are presumably not compatible with that theory at all. Um, well, right, so I don't want, you right, uh, so, okay, if I can maybe extrapolate a little bit from your comment, uh, I don't want to make the case that, uh, you know, that because we have evidence for uh, strong, for preformed pairs, another uh, terminology, um, and that we have evidence that we have a strong uh, attractive interaction, that that means that it extrapolates to other material systems. I don't want to say that. Um, but it, I would say that if, you know, if we think about this as a laboratory for understanding the nature of, a, of an unconventional superconductor, uh, then uh, I think it's, uh, it, is a more, it is a much simpler system. So uh, if we have, I think, uh, some hope, uh, a glimmer of hope, maybe from recent experiments, that we really can start to make a connection going all the way from first principles to all of the emergent phenomena, superconductivity, and so forth, um, using the sensitive probes that we have that we did not have you know, a few years ago. Um, so if we can understand this one, then you know, whether it has a relevance to poop rates, I, I don't really want to say, yeah. Well, I wasn't trying to suggest that. Oh, okay. I was sort of more and more in the spirit of serendipity. So that we have to oh, yeah. Well, there's but lots I mean, of serendipity. I mean, mean, but can I follow up with yeah. this? Because, I mean, strontium titanate is clearly a very odd material. Uh, it conducts at very low densities. You can take even bulk stuff to the, uh, to, to the quantum limit. Uh, you, uh, it's filled with uh, other kinds of defects that you never see, despite the fact that they should be compensating Material much larger than they are. Uh, you know, it, it, it has a very large dielectric constant, so it screens out everything. So, I mean, is this a generalized laboratory to understand correlated materials, or is it a special laboratory built around the unusual properties of strontium titanate? Yeah, well, that's a, I guess that's a good question. Uh, uh, how, so, how much can we generalize from what we are, are learning here? Uh, and I guess, you know, maybe maybe one approach to this would be to say, let's suppose we we get it all worked out. We can suppose we have now in that uh, two-dimensional phase space, we really can improve our physical understanding. We can tighten the loop. We you know go from first principles quantum mechanics, so we really understand the system, and we have all the control. Well, maybe at that point we can really start to do quantum simulation, and then we could simulate cuprate. Uh, I don't know, or some other system. So, um, or we may be able to map uh, whatever we do find. Let's say along the way, as we find the mechanism, right, what the glue that's producing this very strong attractive interaction. Uh, you know, and it's very intriguing, right? This that it's uh, that strong that essentially. Um, can, can exist um, almost in that sort of, in, you know, extreme dilute limit. 
uh, if we can understand that and uh, transplant it or find among the myriad you know, material systems that people are synthesizing, say this is the mechanism that you need to look for, well, that could be interesting as well. Is that uh, the St. Jeremiah? 